Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> Some weeks ago in Cincinnati. So. That's beautiful. Well, as Daily Word reminded us, it would have been the perfect Daily Word for last week, but it's good <laughs> to have reminders. Last week we talked about unconditional gratitude. In essence, establishing gratitude as our default setting, the attitude and perspective that we live in and from, regardless of our outer circumstances. Or sometimes, as I shared last week, to help prevent ourselves from slipping into negativity when circumstances seem to overwhelm us. It's what I like to call thanks living. Trusting, knowing, and expecting to find blessings, or at least lessons, in everything. And remembering that we have the power to choose where we focus our attention, and that what we focus on expands, and what we appreciate, appreciates. And that means that gratefulness isn't so much something we're developing, but rather it's an investment in our own health, success, joy, and prosperity. It's how we consciously shape the life we desire and choose. I gave you a homework assignment last week to complete the sentence, I am gratefully and wonderfully blessed when. And there were three spaces for you to come up with answers. How many did that exercise? In, In your head. You didn't have to write it out just to, to practice it. Well, I, I encourage you to to integrate that as a way of being grateful, and if not that, some other way, so that you begin to um, build up this habit of seeking what's good and what you're grateful for, because it's never too late to start. So this morning, we're going to shift our gratitude focus just a little bit to explore the blessings that come from celebrating diversity and practicing inclusivity, as you could tell from the readings and the music and such. And in the spirit of Thanksgiving, I'm going to use the dining table as the inclusivity metaphor. It was an idea, as I just said, inspired by the song that you just heard, Crowded Table, and a book, A Bigger Table, by evangelical pastor, progressive pastor, John Pavlovitz, who's also the book we're using, uh, Michelle's using for the Advent class. Some of you may have seen his posts on Facebook. Yes. Anybody familiar with, with him? He's very... Um, inspirational and opening and inclusive. The dining table has long been a symbol of many things. The place where we nourish ourselves, where we come together, where we celebrate important milestones, share experience, create new understandings, and yes, give thanks. Unfortunately, however, the dining table also, all too often, has represented a place where diversity is not celebrated and inclusivity is not practiced. Because of an intimate and affirming nature, it's no accident that inequality, segregation, and discrimination, be it racial, religious, gender, economic, or other divisions, are often practiced by denying someone's presence at the table. In our own history, think drinking fountains or coffee shop counter. In fact, a familiar theme in the Gospels, especially in the Gospel of Luke, is Jesus engaging in table ministry as one of the ways that he challenges the dominant systems of his day, including, including the temporal elite's interpretations of Jewish purity laws and also the Roman dominance of the Jews. There are multiple stories of him being criticized by the Pharisees for associating, in essence, dining with tax collectors, prostitutes, and others deemed unacceptable by Jewish law. But of course, more than rebelling against anything, Jesus was embodying divine love and expressing compassion through his inclusive table ministry. As described by Pavlovitz, using, he was using common moments to incubate the sacred, the table representing an altar around which he welcomed the world to experience communion with God through communion with one another. At once, Affirming, lifting up, healing, and blessing those who were often invisible and untouchable in society, while at the same time demonstrating to his followers and detractors who happened to be of higher status the transforming power and grace of being God's love in the world by sharing their table with others. In other words, Jesus teaches that practicing inclusivity is not just a gift to be given, but a blessing to be received both spiritually and practically. For it is in loving one another that we call divine love down into our earthly sojourn 
and create a bit of heaven right here and now. So what better time to practice embracing diversity than at our family's dinner tables this coming Thursday? How many of you experience any trepidation when holiday dinners come up and big groups of family come together and you're just kind of praying that everything will stay peaceful? Anybody? I know in unity we work all those things out and we don't have those kinds of challenges, but... So, <laughs> so how many here will have at your Thanksgiving table multiple generations from grandparents to grandchildren? Cultural and political differences with extended families and friends. Various dietary needs and preferences like diabetic or gluten-free or vegan, etc. And competing priorities. For example, those who want to sit down and enjoy a full meal, that's leisurely and connected versus those who want to balance eating with watching their football games. <laughs> I think we can all relate to, if not all of those things, some of those things. So here are three things to keep in mind to practice inclusivity, keep the peace within yourself and hopefully among everyone present, and experience a more heavenly Thanksgiving. First, remember that everyone adds value. Each member of our Thanksgiving guest list was invited for a reason. Each guest is special to someone and deserves, therefore, and anyway, to be treated with respect. So prior to the big event, prime your gratitude attitude by going through the list of attendees and identifying the gifts and blessings, at least three per each person, that each person brings or has previously brought, even if they're not able to do that anymore. Some of us have family members that are now difficult, but we've had a whole lifetime with them, and there are ways that they were a blessing, at least at some point in our lives. Do that for every person that you expect to be sharing the dinner with, and, and give thanks for how they bring blessings to the whole. The second way is to appreciate differences. We can all agree that we shouldn't ask our vegetarian daughter-in-law or brother or niece or whoever to try the smoked turkey we just prepared in our new electric smoker. <laughs> Acknowledging diversity is the first step, but it doesn't end there. Don't say, just one bite. <laughs> just resist that. Think about what it could mean to that daughter-in-law or brother or niece if we added a new vegetarian dish, such as roasted cauliflower with brown gravy, to our Thanksgiving tradition, as well as what we normally have served. With just a little extra effort, we can help others feel included, and we can demonstrate that their needs are important to us. And when others at the table enjoy the roasted cauliflower as well, we learn that everyone benefits from the commitment we've made to openness and inclusion. I remember um, Bree's dad, my first husband, was Mexican-American, and I learned from his older sister how to make handmade tortillas and enchiladas. And she tried to teach me tamales, but they were really involved. <laughs> so I started bringing enchiladas to our family Christmas breakfast as part of we have, had had you know, eggs and the traditional um, sausage and bacon and sweet rolls and such. But I started bringing enchiladas and some homemade tortillas. And 45 plus years later now, they're still demanded at our family breakfast. If I ever suggested, you know, do we really need enchiladas? Are you kidding? Yes, we have to have the enchiladas. Even additionally, after our divorce, um, Jim was included in our holiday celebrations, all of them, Thanksgiving and Christmas and Philly Pass um, six or seven years ago. And so we practiced inclusion, not just culturally, and it was an expansion that I believe that the food he, he, was, he would make chili oftentimes and such, I believe that that addition is what also created that space for him to continue to be included. Number three, remember to focus on the big picture. The most important thing to remember is what's important, and that where we focus our attention is going to determine our experience. So rather than allowing differences of opinions, beliefs, and our perceptions ruin a gathering, Remembering the reasons we have come together to celebrate and give thanks will go a long way to keep the peace. An excellent tool to use when confronted with an opinion or perspective that differs from our own 
is to say with sincere intention, tell me more. Can you imagine doing that? When you get into a political disagreement, rather than reacting and arguing and trying to make your point, just ask them to tell you more. It's an effective way to increase our understanding and may likely prompt a meaningful two-way exchange that will increase our mutual understanding rather than in, in a frustrated standoff. Another powerful tool is the platinum rule. Anybody heard of the platinum rule? We've all heard of the golden rule, right? Treating others as we w wish to be treated. Well, the platinum rule is treating others as they wish to be treated. Specifically honoring the needs, desires, customs, and beliefs. As our families and social circles become increasingly diverse, it's important to always be considerate and sensitive to the boundaries and expectations of others. A request for activity that may have been a family tradition with new people coming might end up being uncomfortable or in conflict with the new person's values or religious practices or experiences. <laughs> Even commonplace interactions can have subtle cultural nuances to take into account. For example, understanding how different cultures practice shaking hands or not shaking hands or maintaining eye contact or not or how much personal distance we allow one another. Paying attention to all of those things Maybe if you know someone's coming from a different culture, actually even doing some research before the event happens can do a lot to help avert misunderstandings. And when in doubt, ask. If you accidentally cause an offense, apologize graciously. And if it's appropriate, sincerely seek for them to explain and give you more information about their traditions, not as a justification, but just to learn about one another. And finally, just as with adding the vegetarian entree, we can expand our holiday calendars to recognize and celebrate different traditions, like Michelle had brought to us the Day of the Dead, or Hanukkah, or Winter Solstice, or Kwanzaa, or Diwali, which are all celebrations of the light. Being careful to be respectful and open to learning along the way. When we used to have um, Jewish members in our community, we would do the, the Hanukkah and have them light the candles. I don't feel um, it's appropriate for me to read those scriptures, but we always still put out the Hanukkah candles and honor that tradition, reading one of their prayers that is meant for, for like open and community um, sharing. All of these practices create valuable opportunities to improve our own cultural awareness, and our sensitivity and efforts will be appreciated by those being considered, as well as we'll be setting a model of inclusivity and acceptance for everyone present. And of course, our own hearts will expand and be blessed in the process as we weave our commitment to unity and love into our daily walk. Even as we're spiritually committed to inclusivity, unity, and oneness, learning to walk our talk, to celebrate diversity and practice radical inclusivity and acceptance takes committed time, focus, <coughs> effort, and a willingness to extend ourselves in new ways. Inclusion often requires that we walk towards rather than away from our discomfort. We probably will have to get out of our comfort zones to learn something new. But it is well worth the effort paying huge dividends in the richness of our lives, bringing greater understanding and appreciation for all people and traditions that often informs and deepens our own traditions, and creating deeper bonds and connections within our families, our workplaces, and our communities. In short, to fully embrace our spiritual unity, we must continue to step out of our comfort zones and practice in the real world inclusivity and acceptance in our daily walk of life. We must seek to expand our tables and welcome the stranger in our midst. To discover what it truly means to love one another, we must understand and see ourselves in one another. And in that way, we'll pull God's love down into earth, creating a little slice of heaven in the process. The communion ritual that we're about to engage in symbolizes for me Jesus' life, teachings, and transforming love by employing his inclusive table ministry and embodying the heart of the gospel, in essence, the ever-expanding hospitality of God. 
And so we will now begin our communion. It is our Thanksgiving.